for the last eight years of my post-secondary school training, I've actually been the only Black student in my class. It's not only made it more difficult to find mentorship, but also to find solidarity and allyship in times where I believe I faced discrimination. My third year of medical school, during my clerkship, clinical rotations, I had an encounter with a patient who asked me to leave the room because they did not believe that as a black woman I could also be a part of the medical team. I thought that if I wanted to pursue a career in health sciences, it was become a doctor. I never I never knew that research and you know research on communities, underserved communities actually existed. I think meeting mentors earlier in my life would have made me feel a lot more supportive and also would have opened my eyes to all these opportunities. I think I had a very narrow view of what careers could be. Being a woman and also someone who is a person of color, um, these two identities um, definitely have intersected in my life um, and have sometimes made me feel like I need to work twice as hard as anybody else to try to prove myself. Um, and it can often be quite intimidating to be in a space where you don't look like anyone else in the room um, and really having to constantly remind yourself and everyone there that you deserve to be there. Beginning with our summer student program and with the support of our donors, will offer financial and mentorship support to engage, retain, and advance women and individuals from underrepresented communities in the health sciences. Through awareness and outreach, we'll connect with women who may be on the brink of believing the barriers they face are too great to pursue their dreams. Medicine thrives with diversity, and you can bring that unique perspective and lens that really enriches the experience for everyone. With a diverse body of scientists who represent women everywhere, we can discover, address, and close the health gaps that are putting women's lives and well-being at risk. The summer mentorship program with U of T back in high school really showed me how important mentors are and how important it is to like see yourself in like different spaces. I also saw the power of diversity in terms of care. People in those specific spaces know nuances of, of the specific community that they want to serve, that they're a part of. I am representing my community. I am an ally. I am black girl magic personified. I am the future. We, we are, are women. women. Black Girl Magic Personified. <laughs> Wonderful. It's one of my favorite videos and a culmination of another dream. So welcome back for our final segment. Thank you for coming back in the room. I know how hard it is. It's like a gravitational pull. Um, I want you to know that this next session is really important because it addresses a lot of the systemic issues that we've been talking about. How do we get more representation so we don't have to advocate for ourselves, so that research is there, the people are there. And as you saw in the video, we have a long way to go, like in so many of these discussions, but tonight we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done to move the dial. Today, still only 28% re of researchers are women and a fraction are racialized. I can say when you walk around Women's College Hospital, you don't feel that way because as you saw, 50% of our researchers are women and many, many more every year are racialized. And that's what we want for the whole healthcare system. We need this because, you know, it, was, it wasn't until the late 1990s that in Canada, the very first medical school graduate of indigenous heritage graduated, 1990. So that tells you how far we have to go. And without diversity in researchers who will bring their lived experience to the table, it's impossible for us to move the dial. And without diversity, we will not have the best minds at the table. So Women's College Hospital, for those of you who do not know, and this is an education session, so one of the things we want you to know is that we do have a, an institution dedicated to research on women. And we have one of the only hospital-based research institute focused on women. And we are positioned like no other to advance equity in this area. 
In 2020, just shortly after I started, I had a conversation with uh, one of our researchers, and they talked about this inequity in research, and that's where the idea of the Emily Stowe Society was hatched. And it was to make sure that diverse women and underserved communities and underrepresented communities got the funds they need and deserve to stay in research, to research the things they care about, to advance the research in the communities that were so underfunded. I want you to know that the Emily Stowe Society is 100% funded by donors. And the way we started is not the way we thought we would. In 2020 at our gala, we decided we were gonna to try to raise money for this small program. And we decided we were gonna be really ambitious and try to raise 100,000 in 10 minutes which sounds crazy, but if you've met me, I like a little crazy, especially when we're trying to break down walls. What shocked me probably more than anyone is that we did not raise $100,000 in 10 minutes. We raised $200,000 in five minutes. I can remember watching the, the, the dollars roll in and people clicking into the system. We actually shut down the system for a while. And after only a year, on the next anniversary, we were just $200,000 away from $1 million. And we were able to eclipse that in 2021. And many of the donors, I see McKesson, I saw Carol Cowan, I saw many people here who seeded that those donations are here tonight to celebrate with us as we begin to see the impact of investing in diverse community, in communities, in brilliant researchers who until now were really shut out of the process. So I'm gonna welcome back to the stage, Dr. Rulan Parekh, who joined our leadership team in 2021 and is a trailblazer in her own right. That research institute, when she became the head of the research institute, she became the first racialized woman, we believe, in North America to hold that position. So every day, we are breaking down barriers. And Dr. Parekh will be joined with the leadership team at the hospital, and under her guidance, she will share her vision for the Emily Stowe Society, which is even further than I could have even imagined it. Welcome, Dr. Parekh. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you for uh, thank you for staying for this session because it's so important to me to be able to highlight and talk about the Emily Stowe program, and for all of you who've uh, donated or are interested in hearing more about it. One of the things that's so important to me about the Emily Stowe program is that representation matters. And if we're gonna make change, we really need to make that change. And as you heard from Heather McPherson earlier today is that we really believe at Women's that we can make that change internally. And then the hope is that we go out and influence the whole system. And so you're helping us make that change. So thank you so much for that. What I'm gonna do now though is introduce a couple of guests today that have really come out as part of our first cohort. So if you don't know already, we've actually funded more than 20 students over the summer. That included 13 high school students. And so we're trying to start the path early and encourage them in science at a very early stage. And we hope to continue to grow that program over the next few years. So I'd like to introduce Aza Osman, Heba Robel, and Idris Khalifa. So if they could come out. And if you could give them a round of applause for all their work. So we had these pins specially made because we wanted to give it to them to honor them for all the work that they've done and to thank them for everything that they've done for us. Thank you. So we're just gonna have a bit of a conversation and so that you can get to meet the scholars. And these are only two of amazing men and women that have really joined us. And uh, I got to have lots of coffee chats with them and I was inspired every day. Um, what I'll really start, perhaps Asma, we can start is, can you introduce yourself and tell us about the work you did at Women's this past summer? Yeah, of course. 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Aza. Um, I'm a recent undergraduate or graduate from Western University and I did my undergraduate degree in health sciences. I'm currently doing a master's degree at the University of Toronto um, in the Faculty of Information and I'm doing a concentration in user experience design. Uh, over the summer, I had the privilege to work here at Women's um, with the Weave team and the project that I was working on was called the PDIAA project, which stands for Patient Identity uh, or Patient Digital Identity Authentication Authorization. Uh, and essentially that project was uh, centered to, or it was focused on evaluating a digital health service that focused on allowing patients to access their digital health information uh, through a safe and secure way. So essentially we're working uh, towards allowing you to access your health data uh, safely and securely from you know, your, your cell phones. Um, and yeah, so the, uh, the project was specifically centered on uh, digital identity. And in case you don't know what that is, that's uh, essentially the transformation of human identity into uh, digital data. Um, through an authorized process. And so I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the multi-step authorization, and that's often done with using your bank information or you know, like a government, any sort of government ID, and that's essentially just like a way to confirm your identity online so you can safely access your health information. Um, during my experience uh, at PDIA, we did a lot of comprehensive work. We did uh, environmental scans, literature reviews, uh, to explore digital ID across the world, as well as other provinces, uh, just to familiarize ourselves with the different types of services and systems that are in place. Um, we also conducted uh, interviews with patients who actually use digital services and evaluated the ways that uh, they, you know, their user experience and the uptake barriers and facilitators and the usage patterns um, using these softwares and essentially use that to, uh, to sort of guide our research and our work in that realm. Um, and I thought it was a really relevant area of research, especially just given the fact that we're now navigating a post-pandemic world um, and, you know, technological, uh, you know, uh, access to our information is, is very relevant, very needed to bridge those equity gaps. And so I felt very privileged uh, to be a part of, you know, the work in progress um, in this area of health reform. I Yeah, I think the work that you're doing, people don't realize that in fact uh, health data may not be as secure and we really need to think about how to make it secure because we want to have some data accessible, right, to be able to address inequities, so that exactly. was great. Heba, could you go on and tell us about what you did this summer? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Heba Robel and I'm a first-year master's student in health services research at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm specializing in health informatics research. And I also just recently completed my honors bachelor's degree um, in life sciences also at the University of Toronto. Uh, over the summer, I've been very lucky to have worked at um, really with one initiative called the Canadian Network for Digital Health Evaluation at um, the Center for Digital Health Evaluation at Women's. So essentially, because of the pandemic, we've seen so many digital health tools be sort of put forward and being used in care. However, there isn't really a common way to evaluate these tools, especially with respect to dimensions like equity, accessibility, and quality. So one of the things that the center did, and this was before my time at Women's College, was create a pan-Canadian framework for digital health evaluation, which um, really is supposed to be a guide for digital health teams across Canada to use to evaluate their work. Um, this initiative also includes um, a network where we wanted um, policymakers and decision makers and scientists to sort of come together and use this framework um, in their work. And one of the things I did was sort of figure out who were the key stakeholders in the digital health space in Canada and try to bring them to the wonderful work being done at Women's College. Thanks so much. <laughs> It may be surprising to you, but our health authorities don't always know how they're to evaluate digital services. So thanks, Heba, for helping with that. Um, one of the things that I think that I always ask, and I always ask this every summer, but I always want to learn sort of what was the most unexpected or surprising thing that you learned over the summer. So maybe, Heba, you could start. 
Of course. Um, to kind of jump off of what you said, um, just figuring out how complicated um, the healthcare organization landscape is in Canada was really interesting. Um, it's one thing to kind of understand how Ontario organizes our healthcare workforce and healthcare um, authorities and the difference between the Ontario health teams versus LHINs, um, but to understand that every province and territory organizes, it, organizes themselves in a completely different way was um, interesting, to say the least. Um, and yeah, it was just a really unique thing to kind of come across and in order to kind of f figure out who the key stakeholders were with respect to digital health, it took, you know, a very, it took, it definitely takes a very strong understanding of how um, healthcare is really structured within each province. Yeah, I think one of the most surprising things in my research was realizing that digital health or virtual health is very, it's very uh, established across other countries and there are a lot of sophisticated systems already in place. And you think that living in Canada is a first world country, um, you know, like, our, our, I mean, our healthcare system is great, but just seeing that um, kind of makes you realize that there's so much more work that needs to be done. Uh, during my experience um, working on the PDIA project, we talked to a lot of stakeholders across the world. I remember um, one specific interview really stood out to me. It was with a stakeholder from Denmark, and he was talking about DEMID, which is their uh, digital ID system in place over there. Um, and I think it's honestly been it's been in use for at least over a decade, and so their users are very well equipped and very familiar with that system. Um, and issues sur surrounding security and privacy, uh, it's not really a great concern for them over there. Um, and actually, once you hit the age of 15, you're given a digital ID and you're already you know, introduced to that way of you know, accessing your information. And so um, it, it really leads you to, or it, it makes you really reevaluate the Canadian system. And um, I, I mean, it, it, it was great because now we do know that these systems do exist and that it is a possibility. I'm really looking forward to seeing Canada's progress in that sense. Well, hopefully you'll be part of that progress. Right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. making those changes, yeah. yeah. I think when I, we spoke earlier, I think one of you used the phrase fragmented, and I think it was yeah. stunning to see the fragmentation that you would see either provincially or even federally, Absolutely. right? So hopefully you can both advocate for that. And really, how will you advocate in thinking about your next steps and what you're currently doing with your careers? We can start, maybe, Laza, you uh, go first. Yeah, go. of course. Um, well, I, I guess just to start off, um, I, I think in general my experience here at Women's, and especially this past summer, has been one of the most life-changing experiences of my life, and it really um, led me, or allowed me to view healthcare in a very multi-dimensional lens, um, and made me consider it in a much more holistic way, and in a way that's considerate of healthcare beyond just the walls of the hospital. Right? Healthcare is so much more than just what your experience is in the doctor's office. Um, and I did want to just uh, talk a little bit about my academic uh, history, but I was actually a nursing student before going into this area of study. Um, so yeah, when I entered Western, I was a nursing student, because I always knew I wanted to contribute to the healthcare system in some way, shape, or form, and I figured that nursing would be a great way, and it really is, and you know, I love nurses, and I think their work is incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and, and my experience as a nursing student, I, I really did love the program, and I loved um, the experiences that that program have, has given me, um, but actually my first placement was in 2020, so that was the beginning of the pandemic, and during my placement, um, I really started to see the, the value of having technology in healthcare, especially at a time where accessing healthcare was so difficult for a lot of people. Um, and so I, I really wanted, I really targeted that and I wanted to delve more into it. So I switched from nursing into health sciences because I wanted to go straight into my master's. Um, and so I did some more, you know, I took some courses and applied to U of T and, you know, here I am. Um, so I guess I to directly answer the question, uh, doing research um, in, um, on the PDIA project really, uh, you know, exposed me to these gaps and the equity barriers and the accessibility barriers and all of those um, areas of concern uh, within specifically virtual healthcare and digital healthcare. 
Um, and so I'm really looking forward to use the um, knowledge that I've gathered here at Women's, as well as my academic experiences, as well as the skills that I'll hopefully pick up from my current program to contribute to later research um, in digital healthcare, as well as hopefully maybe designing some health technologies as well. <laughs> Um, I would love to second that response, that was wonderful. Um, <laughs> I totally agree that um, virtual care, de there's definitely so much potential in that area and we can really, you know, we definitely, especially after coming out of a pandemic, we really do have the opportunity to build an equitable virtual care ecosystem that really benefits all of us rather than just a few. And it's really important that research, you know, leads that way. Um, thankfully, in my master's program, I'm going to be able to lead um, a research project with marginalized communities with respect to digital care and virtual care. So a lot of the insights I've been able to gather at Women's College will be directly um, influential in my work. Thanks so much for joining us today. I think we just wanted to give everyone in the audience a bit of a flavor. These are two remarkable women. I think the future is bright. And just so you know. <laughs> and I think that it's important to know that they are two of a larger group and they were all phenomenal this summer. And so I think it was quite amazing and it was extremely exciting. And uh, actually I teared up at the last session because it was so exciting to see how well they had done and lovely to meet them and, and have them with us. So our hope is that as part of the Emily Stowe, they join this family that we have at Women's College and they'll continue to be included and bring them to sessions like this so that you can meet them and see their progress and hopefully mentor future uh, students as we get them along. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. So I realized I was remiss because I didn't sort of give a slide um, to just say that besides the students, the Emily Stowe program also supports faculty. And the, it's really important that we also support faculty so that we can make sure that we recruit, retain them, and engage them and advance them as they go through their uh, science uh, career. Uh, some of the funding has gone to Dr. Lorraine Lipscomb, who you've met already, who will be out again, Dr. Dana Ross, uh, our nurse practitioner, Niru Banderi, who you're going to hear from, and Faith Delareas. And we're fortunate to have um, uh, Niru and Lorraine come and speak to us about their work. And what I think is great is that you'll be able to hear a little bit about their work that they've done and see how it's really benefited from the Emily Stowe program. So first off, we're gonna have Nero come and present. And I think it's important that I, I sort of tell you a little bit about her so you can hear her story, that she's uh, the Emily Stowe Emerging Leader Program. She's a nurse practitioner and adjunct lecturer at the University of Toronto. She's worked for four years in our sexual assault and domestic violence program at uh, Women's College, and now she's also working at the Baycrest Center for Birth Control, where she's been for the past six years. New is going to be speaking about her work to expand access to health care for women who are seeking an abortion. This is a really difficult topic, because at Women's, we believe that access to safe and supportive care is really a health care right for all individuals. As a leader in sexual and reproductive health, together with our partners, we've worked relentlessly to remove barriers to care, reduce the gaps in accessing this essential level of care. Ensuring safe and accessible care is critical for women who make this choice for themselves. And Niru is now going to present on her work um, that she's done and that's really been pivotal, especially during the pandemic. So please welcome Niru Banderi. Good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to see all the people finally in person, then virtually. Um, my name is Neeru Banderi. I'm a primary care nurse practitioner at Bay Center for Birth Control at Women's College Hospital. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening uh, in this important educational summit. I also wanted to thank the Emily Stowe Society and its donors and it's um, for supporting me and giving, giving me this opportunity to speak today and doing this, uh, uh, working on this great initiative. So I chose this quote today by Justice Ginsburg because just like Dr. Emily Stove, she was a pioneer in women's rights in recent years. She battled sexism in her own life and career, but despite that 
con she continued to continue to fight for women's rights, gender equity, and financial equality. As a Emily Stove grant recipient, I wanted to focus my project on a topic that I've been passionate about, and one that needs to be highlighted further as millions of women are currently impacted by the recent federal changes south of the border. So medical abortion is a procedure that uses medica medication to end a pregnancy. It's safest and most effective during the first trimester of pregnancy. So a little bit of history in the Canadian um, sort of uh, system. Uh, 2015 is when the abortion pill was approved by Health Canada. Uh, a couple years after that, it was available to the public. And um, recently in 2019, uh, Health Canada removed the requirement for ultrasounds as uh, to confirm gestation. We all know that women have always been underserved in healthcare. And once the pandemic hit, the lack of access to healthcare was felt by every aspect, whether it was someone just accessing contraception or prenatal care, or someone accessing surgery for fibroids or requiring palliative care. This access to care was especially challenging for women of color. However, the pandemic did help, uh, help us realize the importance of virtual care and telemedicine. As we are forced to adapt to this new emerging care model, it provides a number of benefits, including easy access, effectiveness, safety, and acceptability of virtual care. To enable better access, Bay Center, where I work, we moved to add virtual care to our services. Starting June 2020, we included the virtual care model for abortion care and some of the reasons why this worked really well uh, for our patients was because patients obviously couldn't come due to COVID, one of the big reasons. Uh, traveling long distances and saving on cost of travel. They didn't need to take time off to attend an appointment. And it provided a lot of privacy and safety for patients who are in unsafe situations. Lastly, if eligible, they did not require an ultrasound or blood work to uh, access um, the abortion pill. I did an analysis of patient data from June 2020 to July 2022. We had approximately 100 patients virtually for a medical abortion. After analyzing this data, we concluded that clients were coming from all over Ontario, from three kilometers from our hospital to about 300 kilometers. Uh, most clients did not require any diagnostics and approximately 95% success rate, which is great. Um, and it also improved uh, significantly patient satisfaction. And we continuously also, uh, we provided pharmacy uh, education to pharmacists about coverage for um, uh, the pill, because it is covered under OHIP, but a lot of pharmacies outside the GTA don't know about it, and that it's covered through OHIP, so we continuously provide that um, education and make sure that the patients don't have to pay for it. So we have the capacity to do more virtual care, hence my focus is to increase access for patients needing medical abortion virtually. We can achieve this through reaching remote communities and building partnerships with organizations such as Center for Wise Practices, Shelter Safe, and Black Health Alliance, and multiple other organizations that we can work with to uh, make this more accessible. Moving forward, um, my focus is to build partnerships and form connections with patients and communities. I hope to focus my work on capacity building with, for healthcare professionals who are interested in providing this care and expanding their services. So some of the organizations I've been speaking with are nurse practitioner-led clinics. There are 25 of them in Ontario. And uh, believe it or not, there's very few handful clinics that are providing the service. Um, and other clinics have been wanting to do it, just never had the opportunity or the resources to, uh, or education to kind of uh, start to provide this. So I hope to try and uh, build a protocol to help these uh, providers provide, uh, give the services in their communities rather than referring their patients to women's college. I mean, we're happy to see them here, but it's better to do some capacity building instead. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, 
and I'm honored to be able to continue uh, this work with the help of the Emily Stove uh, Scholar Program. So thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, Nira, for really addressing this uh, access to care issue. I'd now like to actually reintroduce Dr. Lorraine Lipscomb, who's a senior fellow in the Emily Stowe program. She's a senior scientist with Women's College Research Institute and endocrinologist at Women's College. And she, as you've already heard, will highlight some of her research that was done that was awarded through the Emily Stowe program. And we're really uh, welcome to uh, listening to her again. So welcome, Dr. Lipscomb. Hello again, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Emily Stowe Society and, and uh, the donors for the generous support of my research and for giving, you, giving me the chance to speak to you today. My research broadly addresses, just one second here. My research broadly addresses how to improve diabetes care and prevention with a specific focus on how diabetes is affecting women in Canada and how we can help this population. So over one million Canadian women have diabetes, and we also showed in some early research that young women under the age 50 have seen the biggest rise in diabetes. And so it's important that we think about how we can specifically address the unique risks and unique needs for this population. And so the goal of the research that I've been fortunate enough to uh, to be able to do, thanks to the Emily Stowe Society, uh, that I'm going to be presenting you to today was, had, was one, to identify groups of women who are at higher risk of developing diabetes, two, to create a prevention program for this population that uniquely addresses their needs and, and um, uh, issues, and three, then, to test the effectiveness of that program. And so, as you heard, one such group of women who have, we know have a higher risk of diabetes are women with gestational diabetes. And as I mentioned before, this is a temporary condition of pregnancy that affects around 10% of women and often goes away after delivery. We treat it during pregnancy to reduce the risks to the baby, but we also know that it increases the risk of diabetes in the mother by sevenfold, and in fact, it is an early marker of risk for diabetes with one in five going on to develop diabetes as early as 10 years after delivery. So in my clinical practice, I knew this and I would try to talk to women, counsel them, offer them resources to help them address this risk. But I was frustrated that I didn't really have a plan or resources to help them. And we tried to actually offer programs and create programs for new mothers, but most didn't show up as they were too busy with their babies and the programs that we were creating didn't really fit for them. Sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> so we were missing a key window of opportunity for diabetes prevention at a time in women's lives when they are accessing healthcare, when we've identified a risk factor, and when they are often motivated uh, to make ch healthy changes for them and their family. Now, but the problem, there are several reasons for this gap in prevention care for this population. First of all, we know that as diabetes resolves in most after delivery, diabetes follow-up is rarely offered. Women are asked to screen for diabetes and make lifestyle or behavior changes and see their family doctor, but they're not given any support and education for this. And as a result, very, uh, women often don't go see their doctor and they don't get screened. There's also limited resources for this type of service. But we also know, and our research has shown, that there are barriers for patients. So our research has shown that many women are often unaware of this risk for diabetes, and some of them even have a false reassurance that the diabetes is no longer a problem when it goes away after delivery. And so there's a lot of mixed messaging there. But the reality is, is there is, a, this is a time of, of many competing demands for women after they deliver. Um, they, they, you know, the, their priority, they prioritize their new maternal role, their role in the family, and their, and you know, there's often t lack of sleep, low energy, limited support. And so for all of these reasons, 
you know, it may be very difficult for women to access health services and to be able to prioritize their own self-care. And as a result, self-care comes last. And so we set out to design a, a better program, one that fit for this population that was feasible and flexible to help women make sustainable behavior changes. So we, we developed this program based on um, evidence from literature as well as surveys and interviews and based on a highly successful program at Women's College Hospital uh, from the Cardiac Rehabilitation Services that was uniquely designed specifically for women at high cardiac risk. And so we were able to develop the Avoiding Diabetes After Pregnancy for Moms, or ADAPT-M program. And this program uses several evidence-informed strategies. First of all, uh, we use low-cost virtual health coaching that's delivered by certified diabetes educators. Each woman is assigned to a health coach in the community for six months. Virtual uh, services make it more feasible for busy moms to make changes from the comfort of their own homes. And the coaches are also given um, resources that, and, and help to help women identify resources when they're with, within their own communities. Um, uh, it also uses uh, proven behavior change techniques, such as uh, goal setting, motivational interviewing, and women are given customized diet and physical activity education that meets their needs, their resources, their abilities, and, um, and allows women to have frequent regular phone follow-up and check-ins to help them advance those goals over time, troubleshoot, and keep them, uh, help them stay on track. So then we sought out to test the program, first in a pilot phase and then in a, in a con randomized controlled trial, comparing the program to usual care. We have now just completed the trial. We're still analyzing the results, but I can tell you we were able to enroll 335 women. We had a very multi-ethnic diverse population of 70% non-Caucasian. And I can tell you that 71% of the women actually stuck with the program for six months, which is actually uh, considered a success for this population. Um, when we asked women uh, their satisfaction with the program, 95% rated it as good to excellent, and 87% said they would recommend it to others. And I'll end here with a quote from one of our participants. I learned so much from the study in terms of making changes in my lifestyle and pushing myself to do better for me and my family. And so our goal is to eventually expand this program across Canada and uh, Ontario and Canada to help women with GDM have healthier lives. But we also know that um, you know, even though this is a good start and a step in the right direction, as I mentioned earlier, there are factors that are beyond women's control that we also need to address, more upstream socioeconomic factors. And so, um, I'm really pleased that I'm actually able to work in another area of research where we're actually looking at ways to make communities healthier and to break down socio uh, socioeconomic barriers for women, to make it easier for them to be able to do those things that they need to do to keep themselves healthy. Thank you very much. Um, I remember the question that was asked, you know, do we have to do all the advocacy? Do we have to be the only ones um, asking the questions? What I hope you got out of particularly the last presentation is that we are trying hard to answer those questions so you don't have to ask those questions. So there are pathways that are set up where you just walk through the door. And again, 20 years from now, we hope that so many more women will have so many more pathways where they just walk through the door. One more round of applause for our Emily Stowe Scholars. The future is bright. Oh my God, did you hear these young people talk? I was terrified. I'm like, you know, I cannot even work my iPhone. And these people are figuring out pathways for identity online. Um, I have to tell you, I am always so hopeful um, at the end of anything I do here at Women's College Hospital. But I, I have to say, going out into the crowd tonight and hearing and seeing everybody in community, seeing our sponsors and seeing our donors and seeing the new people and our faithful come together is honestly one of the highlights of my life, and I thank you. All right. 
So, I hope, we hope, we don't just hope, we promise things will get better. And we do that because you came, you care, you are in community, you are working with us. And we have allies in this room. And we have allies outside this room. And no one is going to stop us. I want to thank all of our presenters. I want to thank the incredible team that helped put this evening together. As I said, I wanted to do this. And all I heard was, how can we make this happen? As we draw this evening to a close, you know this is just the beginning. It has to be. Listen to all that we have to do. There is so much to be done. But I hope you feel more hope. I hope you feel more trust. I hope you feel we are on your side. And there is a hospital, and there are people with you in every room fighting for the things that are important to you. So thank you again to our Emily Stowe Society scholars. Thank you to all of our presenters, our fellows. Thank you to Women's College Hospital for creating a place where this was possible and is possible. I want to say a special thanks to people that are on stage with me but aren't here physically but are out in the crowd. Some of them could come, some of them could not. First of all, my family who have to put up with me, you can only imagine <laughs> what they've had to put up with. My wonderful partner, Evan, who is literally my heart and soul. My son left because he looks so good, he had to share it with other people. <laughs> and the people backstage said they have never seen a crowd look so good. And I said, I know. <laughs> but there are people on stage with me that inspired me to do this long before this evening. And I just want to call out a few of them. All of my friends at the Black Health Alliance, one of the first groups I met with when I went to Women's College Hospital. I will do the disclaimer, I am on the Black North Board, but long before I was on the board, I signed that pledge and said, we must move the dial. So the Black North is here in the house. The Black Physicians of Ontario and the Black Nurses, where would we be without you? And I got to tell you, uh, you know, one special person, One Nurm at U of T, many people know her. She is an advocate and a champion for so many things and carries such a burden. And I hope today we are unburdening her so, and spreading that load. I want to thank some personal friends, uh, Dr. Natisha Masakwai. I have to tell you, they don't build them that, like that every day. This woman, again, pocket-sized, but mighty, <laughs> and has the best glasses all the time, I got to say, wherever she's getting them from. And Shay Marville, who has been by my side for over, oh gosh, I'm dating myself, 30 years, and, you know, is my patron saint on my mental wellness. And finally, I want to say a big thank you to my foundation team. You know, I get to stand up here and look like I'm in charge. They're really in charge. <laughs> Without them, I am nothing. I stand on their shoulders. I tell them the dreams that I have, and they make them a reality. They built this evening for you. It was built for us, by us, but with the help of supporters and allies. <laughs> it's a privilege to work with them all every day and my wonderful board who support me in every way. I want to thank you as we come to a long evening, but some say, not long enough. We need to do a Saturday all day, <laughs> and we'll get there. It's been a long day, but a short day, because we've gotten so much out of it, I hope. I want you to have a great evening, but more importantly, I want you to continue this journey. I want you to stay in touch with the wonderful people you've met. I want you to share the information. All the resources we talked about, which I know went by in a blur, will be uploaded and put online for you. And they will be available to everyone because this is the house that Equity built. I want you to know that I will not say goodbye. I will say until we see you again. And I want you to never forget that we are women's. Good night. Be safe. Thank you for coming.